Chapter 2, Plotting and Mystery, The Soho Cholera Outbreak, 1854. Sarah, wake up. The baby's crying. Sarah Lewis groaned and rolled over, trying to ignore her husband's whispers. It felt as if she'd only just closed her eyes. How could the baby be awake already? She squinted at the light streaming through her thin curtains that listened and listened to the city waking up. Here in London's crowded Soho district, in the heart of the world's biggest city, the noise never entirely went away, even at night, but it did quiet down. Now the noise was building again as the two million residents of London began their day. Sarah could hear the clatter of horses' hooves, the trundle of wagons and carriages rolling over cobbled streets, the shouts of vendors and beggars and newspaper boys. Cutting through it all was the ear-splitting jangle of a hopeful early morning organ grinder. Sarah yawned. It sounded like morning had come to Broad Street. But what had Thomas meant about the baby crying? Their daughter, Frances, just six months old, was fretful and sickly, and they were used to waking up to her wails. But there were no cries this morning that Sarah could hear. She lay still and concentrated. There was the deep, regular breathing of her husband lying beside her, and the lighter breaths of her two older children, sleeping on their pallets on the floor alongside the bed. And yes, there was a tiny whimpering, barely audible, coming from the baby's cradle. Throwing back the sheets, Sarah rose and crossed the room to check on little Frances. She bent over the cradle, crooning a soft morning greeting, but the smile on her face quickly changed to wide-eyed alarm. Frances was thrashing in pain. Her small, pale face glistened with sweat, and her clothes and bedding were soaked with watery diarrhea. Sarah snatched up the baby and rushed to her husband. Thomas, run for the doctor, she employed implored right away. Nothing to fret about. Dr. Rogers, when he arrived later that morning, calmed Sarah's fears. The baby was simply suffering from summer diarrhea, he explained. It wasn't unusual for young children in hot weather. However, Frances would need careful nursing to bring her back to health. He recommended giving the baby a small spoonful of castor oil or syrup of rhubarb to expel the harmful illness and a teaspoonful of brandy mixed with hot water to calm the baby's stomach. To ease the cramps that had her daughter curled in pain, Sarah could apply a mustard plaster made by mixing flour, water, and mustard powder to the baby's tummy. If that didn't work, she could send to the local chemist shop for laudanum. A few drops diluted in water would soon quiet little Frances. Terrible smell in the streets today, isn't there? The doctor said as he packed up his medical bag. Not surprising that the child's ill with such foul air about. Taking him to the front door, Sarah pointed out to the opening of the cesspool, a brick-lined underground pit that held the household sewage. It was just beside the front step and directly under the Lewis's family's windows. The smell is dreadful in this warm weather, but the cesspool's so handy for throwing out the slops, and 40 Broad Street is the best house on the street for a young family. We've got the water pump just beside us so we can fill the water bucket on the same trip, she explained. That afternoon, Sarah did just that. While baby Frances tossed in an uneasy doze in her cradle, the mother wrung out the dirty sheets which had been soaking all morning in buckets of water. A full bucket in each hand, Sarah made her way carefully out to the front door and down the steps, tipping the contents. The disgusting greenish soup of diarrhea and water made her stomach turn into the cesspool. Then she continued over a few places to join the lineup at the Broad Street Street water pump, refilling her buckets with wash water after a short wait. The Angel of Death Visits. Frances' summer diarrhea was getting worse. Soon the baby was so weak she couldn't even whimper. Her eyes were sunk into her head and her skin took on a bluish tinge. Sarah fought back her worry and kept busy nursing, gently rocking the cradle, quietly singing, stroking Frances's back. She only left the family's small room to empty the slop pail or to fetch more water. Usually, Sarah loved the chatter and gossip in the lineup at the pump. 
Now, with all her energies concentrated on the small, fragile life at home, she didn't linger to listen to the latest neighborhood news. Even so, she was aware that all was not right on Broad Street. A strange silence had come over the place. Where was the clatter and turmoil, the nonstop rumble of wagons, the shouts of the street sellers? Even the organ grinders had deserted Broad Street, it seemed. The only sound Sarah now heard from the outside in the wee hours of the night were occasional running footsteps or muffled cries. That night, there was the sound of some, someone sobbing. Sarah's husband, Thomas, a police constable, knew only too well what was wrong, but he didn't want to worry her. Finally, on the third evening of baby Francis's illness, he arrived home and sat down heavily at the table. Sarah, he said flatly, there's sickness and death all through Soho. I've seen the hearse outside almost every house up and down Broad Street. There are so many dead, they're piling them two and three deep in the undertaker's wagon. It's cholera, so they say. Everyone who can is leaving. We've got to go too. Perhaps my brother in the country will take us in. He handed his wife a newspaper. Look here, it's even in the papers. Reluctantly, Sarah read the article he pointed out. This district was attacked by a pestilence, which has unfortunately swept away a large number of persons who were the day before in perfect health. On Friday morning, people might be seen before break of day running in all directions for medical advice. The angel of death had spread his wings over the place. It becomes the duty of all who have an interest in the welfare of the community to investigate the causes of this sudden and frightful attack. Her face grim, Sarah thrust the paper back. We'll, weep. we'll keep the windows shut tight against the sickness. We won't go out unless we must. But to move that child now, child now would be the death of her. Sarah's voice was defiant, but she was fighting back tears. Like everyone in London, she knew that cholera was almost always fatal. The doctors suspected it came from poisoned air rising from garbage heaps, the polluted river, and the raw sewage running in the city's gutters. With the heavy summer heat hanging over London, the stink of rot and sewage was growing worse each day. But until Francis had recovered, they had to stay put and hope for the best. It's all gone quiet. The next day, September 2nd, Dr. Rogers returned to check on Francis. In the Lewis family's room, there was not a sound. Thomas sat at the table, his head buried in his hands. Sarah was on her knees by the tiny cradle. At the doctor's step, they turned to look at him, their faces pinched and drawn, their eyes burning. After four days of suffering, baby Francis had died. Dr. Rogers noted on the death certificate that the cause of death was exhaustion after an attack of diarrhea four days previous. By now, Broad Street was almost deserted. There was no one lined up at the pump. The shops were closed. Every house had its curtains pulled shut. Along the two short blocks of Broad Street stood 49 houses, formerly grand houses of the aristocracy, now mostly rented out to poor laborers that offered shelter to the astounding 860 people. Almost every room was housed an entire family who did their cooking, washing, sleeping, and living within its crowded space. Squeezed in behind the houses and along the alleys were cow sheds, slaughterhouses, and breweries, even a factory for making bullets. All had now gone quiet. Know your enemy. Wait. Oh. On September 3rd, the silence on Broad Street was broken by distant footsteps coming closer. A man appeared. He headed straight for the street's water pump. From a leather case, he took out a small glass bottle, which he filled with water. He capped it, put it to his eye, and stared at the clear liquid for a moment or two, then put the bottle back into the case and strapped it closed. From the clinking as he walked off, it seemed that there might be other bottles inside as well. This unusual man was a doctor and a scientist, 
And at the time when most people broke down in panic at the words cholera epidemic, to him, the Broad Street outbreak was a golden opportunity. He was John Snow, a man who thought he had solved the mystery of cholera and who was looking for a way to prove it. Know your enemy. Dr. John Snow had been studying cholera for more than 20 years. When he was still training to become a doctor, John had been sent to the town of Killingsworth in northern England to help miners who were dying from a cholera epidemic. He was appalled by the terrible conditions in the mines, and he suspected that they were linked to the disease outbreak. In a letter to his family, he wrote, The pit is one huge privy, and of course the men always take their victuals with unwashed hands. We now know that cholera is spread when infected fecal matter gets into food or water, but at the time, no one understood this. The accepted explanation was that cholera was called by my, caused by miasma, a fog of infected air rising from piles of garbage and sewage. John disagreed. How could bad air cause the severe diarrhea he'd seen among the cholera-stricken miners? Since the disease affected the digestive system, he suspected that cholera was caused by something you ingested, something in food or water. At first, John kept his suspicions to himself. After all, he hadn't even finished med medical school yet. He knew his ideas would be laughed at, but he didn't forget about them. He waited for an opportunity to prove his theory. By the 1840s, Dr. John Snow had a thriving medical practice as one of the world's first anesthesiologists, pronounced anesthesiologists a specialist who gives patients medication so they don't feel pain during surgery. Sleeping gases, chloroform and ether, had been discovered that when inhaled made people temporarily unconscious. This was a breakthrough for surgeons and patients. Before the discovery of ether, surgeons had to operate on people who were fully awake. It was so terribly painful, sometimes patients would leap off the operating table in the middle of surgery and try to escape. John invented a regulator to deliver a safe, steady flow of gas to patients. He became so famous for his skill that he was asked to give chloroform to Queen Victoria during the birth of her two children. John's growing knowledge about the properties of gases made him even more convinced that miasma couldn't be the cause of cholera. He learned how concentrated the doses of chloroform and ether had to be in order to put patients to sleep, even briefly, so it didn't make sense that clouds of bad air could infect people throughout an entire city. And if bad air was really causing cholera, why didn't everyone develop the disease? The theory of miasma seemed full of logical inconsistencies, but he had no way to test his suspicions. The cholera came back. A new epidemic of the disease was sweeping Europe, and in the spring of 1853, a year before the Broad Street outbreak, the disease hit South London, the part of the city that lay along the south bank of the River Thames. Still, no one understood what caused cholera or how it spread. Theories abounded. Some speculated that the people in the poor neighborhoods along the river were morally susceptible. Defects in their character made them prone to developing cholera. The miasmatists insisted that it was the smell from the neighborhoods and the river that caused the disease. Jon Snow started wondering where the people along the river got their drinking water. The Great Debate, Miasma versus Germs. Today, it seems odd that so many people, including most doctors, believe disease floated around us in invisible clouds called miasma. How did this get, idea get started? Why did people believe in it for so long? The term miasma comes from the ancient Greek word for pollution. Miasma was thought to be a poisonous mist or vapor rising from rotted garbage and organic matter. Even the word malaria, for instance, comes from the Italian mal aria, literally bad air. By the 19th century, nearly everyone equated bad smells with disease. Even after scientists like John Snow and later Robert Cook, who in the 1880s was the first to identify the bacteria that causes cholera, proved that germs, not miasma, were the sources of disease. 
many people refused to change their opinions. Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing, believed until the day she died in 1910 that miasma was the source of many diseases. And she championed cleanliness, hygiene, fresh air, and sunshine as ways to prevent and cure disease. Nightingale's emphasis on the importance of high standards of hygiene in hospitals had saved millions of lives. And she was right that there was a connection between poor sanitation and diseases such as cholera and typhoid. But the connection is germs, not smells.